Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Do you enjoy that singing? Get yourself all excited about who God is? <laughs> yourself all pumped about what he's done? That's the way we should be when we come here before his presence. I, I just want to go before the Lord again in prayer just because I am excited about how wonderful and marvelous he is. Uh, let's just go before God in prayer. God, just come before you and I thank you for you. We do want to echo again in our hearts that we know and understand that you are what it's all about. Thank you so much that you're deserving of all of our praise, of all of our worship. Mm. Thank you so much that there's no way that we can lift up and magnify you uh, enough. Mm -hmm. And so we just thank you for being able to be here. Ask now that your spirit would be with us as we look at your word, that it would speak to our hearts, that it would make us um, open to hear what you have for us. I know, Lord, as pastor and I speak, it's not our words that will make the difference. It's your spirit man, moving in the hearts of people. And so we're asking that you do that, that you just speak to each individual as needed. Thank you again for the joy of being able to be here in your presence. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Well, we got some memory verses, right? Yep. How many of you doing great on the memory verses? My hand's down. <laughs> That's all right. We're continuing to work through it. That's all right. That's why we say them every week so that we're getting them even in doing that. Psalm 119, 105. Is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Very good. Which one is that about? Biblical, our pillar of biblical. We want to understand, know, and value God's word. That's going to be a pillar of who we are. And so we, we're going to value understand and know God's word and it's not only light so I know where to put my feet it's light so I can see where I'm going both those things the Bible provides for you it'll show you where to stand today and where you're going tomorrow I'm gonna sneeze so go okay number two Colossians 3 17 Colossians 3 17 just, yeah, just a minute, just a minute. Let's just let the sneeze get over. Let's just move on. Everybody give them a bless you on three. One, two, three. There we go. We have now uh, taken care of that. Colossians 3, 17. In everything, in everything you, you do, do in, in word, word, word and, and deed, deed, do everything. Through, or do everything. There's two verses that are real similar, and I keep getting them mixed up. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus. Giving thanks to the Father through, through him. him. Through him. Yeah. Okay. No. Very good. <laughs> we'll keep working on that one. What's that about? What pillar? Intentional. Everything that we do, word or deed, everything being focused on in the name of Jesus for him and for the glory of God. That's why that's the intentional. That's where we're focused on it. Uh, we said we want to meet people where they are and help them grow in their intimacy with God. But that's it's that focus. That's what we want to be about doing. Uh, if you're here and your hope and prayer is to grow in your relationship with God, we hope to foster that for you. If you're here and you don't understand that, you don't even know what that means, we hope to enlighten you. Because we want to meet you where you're at and help you grow in your intimacy with God. Next. Ephesians 3.21. Who knows that one? No one. <laughs> We're waiting on you guys up in the sound booth to make sure that one's up there so we can all feel good. There we go. To him be glory, glory in, in the, the church, church and in, in Christ, Christ Jesus throughout, throughout all generations, generations forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. Man, we did so much better. I don't know what the difference was. Good job up there, <laughs> sound guys. Uh, which one is that? Generational. Generation. It's from throughout all generations, forever and ever. It's not even just about our generations, it's all generations. But here at Marsh, we're generational. We want to see and value and give a voice to every generation. Value and give a voice to every generation. And we even kind of gave you a picture to see that it's not two generations, there's multiple generations that we're looking at doing that with. And then today. Genesis. 2, 18. You shouldn't know that one yet, so you can feel relieved. 
because you haven't, haven't known that, although you may have heard this before. Yeah. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Praise God for helpers. We're emphasis on the first half of that, not the second half of that, by the way, and you can have a discussion about that later. But it's not good that man should be, should be alone. alone. Right out of the gate, Genesis chapter 2, God says, it's not good that man should be alone. And we think that's relational. People matter most. People matter more than programs. People matter most. We can have the best programs in the world. If we don't care about people, it will be meaningless. And so today we want to look and stop and look at that pillar of relational. Relational. Here, I want to give you this quote. And, and Doug Wadan is the one I heard say it. I, I could have looked up who actually he quoted it from. But for me, it's Doug Wadan, Pastor D. Those that knew me, he's the quote that I heard about. No one cares what you know until they know that you care. I see heads going, that's right, that's right, that's right. I mean, that's right. No one cares what you know until they know that you care. Have you ever been trying to convince something of something you know, and they don't even know if you care for them, and they're just like, why are you talking to me? <laughs> right? This is so true. Now, I want you to think about who your favorite teacher is. Think back to your favorite teacher. Right back there is mine. Right? <laughs> the teacher you had. Oh, oh. The teacher you had in school, that's right. Some of you are hoping that if someone was thinking about that, you would be the favorite teacher because you're teachers. But I want you to think back to your favorite teacher that you had in, in, in school. And I want you to ask yourself this. What was one of their great lessons? Tell me one of their lectures. What did they teach you about the Pythagorean theorem that just blew your mind? It is the relationship that we have with those people. It's the nature of your interactions with them that make them your favorite teacher, not their lecture. It's relational. I'll, I confess this before. I'll confess it again. I went back to my high school, went to the principal I had at high school, went to his house at his farm, and apologized to him. Because I was not a good student, nor was I an obedient child. <laughs> And I think the last time I got licks in high school was the 10th grade. In school? In school. Y'all hear that? That's crazy, right? <laughs> We're like, what? And licks so I went to his house and I said, Mr. Potier, I want you to know that Jesus changed my life. I really did turn out pretty good. <laughs> uh, he says, I never had any doubts, John. So he was a good man. Relational. So we're looking at our pillar of relational. I want you to know, if you haven't noticed this, every time what we do is we want to look and see a little bit about what Scripture talks about the pillar. We do that first. And we're going to do that here. We'll talk and look and see what Scripture is talking about the pillar. And then we look at what does that mean for us? What does it look like as a church? And what does it mean for you as a person? We're following the same format. And so if we're going to look at relational, I want to just look through and see the vast areas where Scripture comes out and says relationships are important. Starting with our verse, right? It's right out of the gate, just like I said. Genesis chapter 2, God says, nope. You're designed to have an interaction with other people. Now, I know for some of you, you immediately hate that. You feel that you're an introvert to the core, and you're like, no, I don't ever want to have an interaction with another person. I'm happy and content never speaking to another person. I want you to know that's not God's design. Being an introvert is okay. Being an extrovert is okay. Neither of those are more godly. For clarity's right. sake, right? Neither of those are more godly. Being an introvert in the sense that you need time away to be able to recharge and people drain who you are, that's just the nature of how God made you. But the thought process that you can retreat from everybody, no. God says out of the gate, it's not good for man to be alone. That doesn't matter whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. In that chapter before and in chapter 2, if you read it carefully, you will find that six times, I believe it is, at least five, maybe six times, God said it, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. He saw everything, and it was good, and then it comes to this. He said, it's not good for man to be alone, so we are created for a community. We are not created to be ourselves. Proverbs 27, 17 is a verse that many of you will know. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. 
And so Proverbs is the book of wisdom. That's the way, where it's kind of following these, these principles of truth that we just kind of understand. They're not all promises, by the way. If you read, if you read promise, Proverbs and you think that everything in there is a promise to you, you're misreading it. That's not right. the way it's designed. It's principles that are true. And so what it's saying is that we need each other. Together, we make each other better. Just like iron sharpens iron, makes it nice and sharp, interaction with one another helps to make you better. Amen. That's in the scripture. Then we go to Ecclesiastes 4.12. That's another. Anybody know what that says? Similar concept? Anybody know? Ecclesiastes 4.12? Yeah, there we go. Say it a little louder. You're right to say it louder. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. So here's the verse. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. So here it's this, even this concept of growing outside of, of one-to-one. Now it's growing to this community, this three-strand, when, when we have this bond together of three that makes us unbeatable. By yourself, you're going to be taken out. Put us together with two other individuals and we're unbeatable is the, is the thought process that's going here. It makes us stronger, makes us able to endure more. So we continue to see the, the scripture is going as we advance through. It's telling us you need to be together. Good. How many of you know Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25? Some of you should be able to quote that. Oh, everyone's scared that. They're like, you're going to call on me to say it. Yes, I am. Go ahead, Gina, you want, you want to quote that? No, anybody want to quote that one for us? <laughs> Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Uh, begin to quote that. I, I say it in the New Living, so I don't like to start it because I will make it all go muck off. So I just need somebody that will start it and everybody that knows it will join in. Say it a little bit louder. And let us not. Come on, guys. Yeah, let us not. Let's go. And let us not consider how to stir. And let us, I'm sorry. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I don't know how you could be in a Baptist church for any length of time and not hear the preacher say that. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but even so much the more as you see that day approaching. Yeah. What's been underemphasized is the first part of it. Let yes. us consider ways to motivate one another. Stimulate. The acts yeah. of love and good works. Right, And so our meeting together, this is the dynamic of the way that it's set up. We are to meet together, but our goal isn't just to be here together. Yes. Our goal is to be here together where we can form, where we're motivating one another to acts of love and good works. That's what makes it valuable. That's what gives it importance. Importance. That's relational. And then 1 Thessalonians 2.8 is the last one that we're going to look at. We're just seeing this Old Testament, New Testament. We see multiple of these verses. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Mm-hmm. You hear that in Paul's writing? I mean, that's so good, isn't it? Mm-hmm. He's saying that oh, we had developed such a relationship with you that it's not just that we want to share the gospel. By Thomas, I'm sorry. By Thomas. <laughs> My grandson's walking out, surprised to see him. Bye, Thomas. I got sidetracked. Not only do we want to share the gospel with you, we want to share all of ourselves with you. You can't do that without relationship. No. No. There is no way this verse lives out without developing relationships. You can't. Mm -hmm. And so fundamentally, we see in Scripture over and over again this concept of relational of be relationship, be relational. But also, and you're going to help me with this, because not, I'm not asking for a verse here. I'm not asking for you to give me the verse. Don't worry, you don't have to give me the verse. We just want you to, to think of it conceptually. Throughout Scripture, I think that God cares about relationships and gives us two things that I want you to share me what those might be in Scripture. Advice on relationships and examples of relationships. So you're going to share with me now here in areas that you think that God has given advice about a relationship 
or an example of a relationship that in Scripture where we see that relationships matter, that he's showing relationships, okay? And so another difficult, I'm going to give you the first and, the, and probably one of the easiest ones, but I'll give that first one you're thinking through this. So one place, clearly we see that God has given uh, advice about relationship is on marriage. If you want to know how a marriage should work, God's given you advice. Man, there's such great passages that talk about all sorts of things. So I'm going to give two passages that are about wives. You see, the first one's going to be, ah, and the second one's going to be, ah. And I'm going to give you a reference. I'm just telling you the point. Point number one was that it's better to be uh, on the rooftop of a house than with the wife who goes drip, 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 nagging. How many women have heard their, uh, somebody say that verse to them? <laughs> it's better to be in the rooftop of a house than with it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, right? And so that's truth. But it also says, your wife is a gift from God. Man, that's right. Ooh, that there's to be a cherishing of. Because it's not just this random happiness. It's God's gift to you. And so there's a bunch of it, right? That's just too, there's a bunch throughout of, of advice about marriage relationship. Because God thinks it's important that that relationship works well. What else? Either a type of advice... Or a relationship that you see where it says that it matters. You're going to preach today and you didn't even know it. Here we go. Loudly. The prodigal son showing unconditional love. That relationship dynamic. Very good. You got to be louder. Both because I can't hear anymore and so that everybody else hears you. Yes. Yes. God talks to us about how do we interact with our child and, and with our parents. It tells us how that's supposed to be because he cares about that relationship. What else? Love your enemies. God tells us how our relationship is supposed to be with those who don't like us. By the way, that love doesn't mean a warm, fuzzy kiss on the cheek. It means looking out for their best interest. It's the highest form of love, looking out for what's best for your enemies, sir. What else? What about unity in the church? Unity in the church. God gives us advice on how our relationships with one another as fellow believers is supposed to look. How come? Because he cares about our relationships. What else? Friendships. Yes. He says this is what makes a good friend. This is what makes a bad friend. This is the way that we're supposed to interact. This is what you can expect in friendships. Absolutely. God cares about what our friends look like, our friendship relationship, and gives us advice on it because he cares about our relationships. What else? Anybody got an example one? One of an example of a relationship in Scripture? Jonica? Uh, yeah, I thought that was the obvious one too. I thought that was the first home run, right? David and Jonathan showing this deep relationship between them and the way that they look at it. What, what Pastor was talking about, of looking out for both the best interest of that's Jonathan. Jonathan. David is the guy who's going to take his kingdom. Yep. Jonathan is the heir who should be, and David is the one that God has chosen to be the next king. And Jonathan loves and protects David. Man, what an example of the way mm -hmm. our relationship should work. How they look. There's, there's one that I like best because I'm given to melancholy. <laughs> My temperament is given to melancholy. When Elijah was deeply depressed, one of the things God gave him was Elijah. He gave him a friend to invest in. Not to minister to him necessarily, but so that Elijah could invest in Elijah's life. And the result was when Elijah left this earth, Elijah was twice the spiritual giant that Elijah was because Elijah invested in. So we need those kinds of relationships. When you're depressed, the answer isn't get somebody to minister to me. It is to find somebody you can pour your life into and it'll bring you out of it. Anybody else? Yes, Gene, excellent. I did. Yes, that's fantastic. The Ruth and Noah emulation, that's a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law and going outside the bounds of what would even be the expectations culturally 
-hmm. you know, where there was freedom and, and going beyond those and living uh, the relationship out in a way that's honoring to the Lord. And in the end of that relationship, Gene, what happens? Uh, Ruth, uh, I, I know where I'm going, makes total sense to me, but I understand why it doesn't be. I'm sorry, that's it, what? Lineage of Christ, in the line of Christ, living out that relationship in a way that is honoring to each other, and in the end, that they're a part of the lineage of Christ. Kind of cool, kind of cool. Anything else? Louder. Paul and Timothy, yes! Paul and Timothy, that's exactly right. And caring for each other and the mentor relationship, fantastic one. The, the, the Bible forms and fashions for us a relationship that we can look to to see how to model the way that we interact with one another. Anybody else? I want to cut you out. There is one big one that I think that we need to look and see that we haven't discussed yet. Paul and Timothy? Who said that? Because we just said Paul and Timothy. Paul and Timothy, yeah, Paul and Timothy, that's right. That's why, see, that's why I said i got to say it louder. Yeah, Paul and Timothy, that's the relationship you're talking about. Yes, Paul and Timothy. There we go. There we go. If God wanted to make sure that we knew that relationships were important, and so when God came down and lived in earth, guess what he did? He built relationships. He built relationships. We know more about his interaction with his men than we do his sermons. It's in that interaction with people that we see what Jesus is saying. It's not in the moments of the sermon. Now there's great sermons, Sermon on the Mount, right? It's fantastic. And I'm not saying Jesus didn't preach sermons because he went to the synagogue every week, opened up the scripture and would enlighten him. He preached sermons. He did. But the, the, what we're hearing about is his interaction, his relationship with people. And we get this brief synopsis, kind of, of his message. And then we see his interaction with people. Why? Because relationships matter. What's the second greatest commandment? It's about how we love people. Because the way that we interact with people matters. Relationships matter. Yeah, yeah, the Bible's so bold as to say uh, that if you're not loving the people that are born again, the love of God is not in you. That's a thoughtful kind of stinger. Because the way we know we belong to God is how we love each other. I'm not talking about outsiders, I'm talking about insiders. Anybody else? I don't, want to cut, I don't want to leave you out. You want to share one? I want to leave you out. What we're seeing from this is throughout the entirety of the Bible, right? Cover to cover. Mm -hmm. Relationships are part of what's going on. Relationships matter. God speaks to it. Why does relationship matter so much? See, there's this one key important reason why relationship matters so much that won't make sure that you, that you know. Why does relationship matter so much? And it is because... God's pursuing a relationship with you. Now, man, that's great. Just let that, yeah, we're saying let great that time. fall on you for a moment. God, oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful that God is pursuing a relationship with you. Now, I'm looking at you, and I don't know why. I... I you're looking at me, and you don't know why. If you think there was one attractive thing about you that draws God to you, then you are falsely viewing yourself and God. There is nothing attractive about us that drew God to us except that he's God and wants a relationship with us. We're not worthy of that relationship. But he makes mm. us worthy. He makes us his son. He draws us into a relationship with him all on his own. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look and read your, read your Old Testament and see what God's view of sinners is. See how he feels about sin so that you don't get confused and think that he doesn't care that you're a sinner. 
The Old Testament outlines for us for us very much so. Obedience is extremely important. Sin cannot be tolerated by God. Sin is always punished. There's always judgment. But while we were in that state, still God's enemy, Christ died for us so that he might take us into his family, that he may adopt us. Galatians tell that, adopt us and make us his sons and daughters. I mean, it's amazing. You want to know about relationships? It's God. He is pursuing a relationship with you. Do you know what's sad? This is just, it's heartbreaking. There are probably multiple here today who are here and are a part of church but have never tasted that relationship. That's right. It's saddening. It's worrisome. It, 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 it feels with, with this worry and fear for the hearts and the souls of the people that are here. It's not about being here in church. It's the same way that we read the verse. It's not just being here. It's, it's that pursuit of love. And, and you can be here every week and not have that relationship with God. And I'm just telling you, God's pursuing it. He, he did everything that he could. He died himself on the cross of Calvary. That great punishment that had to happen to sin, it had to happen. And so he received it himself on the cross of Calvary. He died on the cross of Calvary to pay your sin price so that he might have a relationship with you. And we're content to come and just perform religion? Don't be. He wants more. He's pursuing you. And some people just need to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But that's not it. Some people know Jesus and still live in religion. I, I was looking up the word hermit this week. Uh, you know, a recluse. My wife is smiling because John could easily be a hermit. <laughs> In fact, I told her if she dies, I think I'll just move under a bridge. <laughs> we will not let that happen. Just so, so you know. A hermit is someone who lives... Uh, in a lonely, secluded spot, often for religious reasons. This is a dictionary. I'm trying to figure, I guess they're thinking about monks who go into monasteries and and all of that. Or a spice cookie made with nuts and raisins. (laughs) Anybody had a hermit cookie? I never had heard of those. I didn't know it was a cookie. We went to a conference, uh, I guess that was back in the 80s. We'd go up to Frisco, Colorado up in the mountains of Colorado, and we went to this uh, church conference, and it was a lot of fun. We, we'd go in July, beautiful weather up there, and one of the times we were up there, I don't know if you remember this, we went jeeping. Guy took us on our jeep. Well, okay. Uh, and uh, they had a bunch of guys who had jeeps, and we started going up in the mountains, and as you're going up into the mountains, you go through the private land, and then you end up in... Uh, federal land where the federal forest is and all that nobody's allowed to live in there you can camp in those places you can cut down christmas trees you can do that but you can't live and we're going up this mountain road gravel road we get all the way up to where the where the national forest begins and there's a trailer sitting right there here's a guy who has moved as far away from people as he can get he's living on the line between where no one's supposed to live and where he's living and we're going along, and a guy riding in the Jeep with us asks our host, he says, what kind of person lives up here? And he says, the kind that want to be left alone. <laughs> are you like that? Spiritually, are you like that? Some of us are not reclusive in our daily activities, but spiritually, we draw into ourselves We fortify ourselves. We move as far away from people as we can, spiritually speaking. We're on the board. I'm talking about those of us who know Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we're just spiritual hermits. We don't want to interact with people. We don't want to know people. And we certainly don't want people to know us. That is just the opposite of what God is calling us to be and do transparency, living openly before people. In Genesis, when the fall comes, we know that Adam and Eve were living in a garden. They were both naked and unashamed. That isn't because they were good nudists. It's because they were so invested in the other person, they didn't know what they looked like themselves. 
And when sin came to their lives, every thought of them turned inward. Mm -hmm. They saw themselves for who they really were, and they sought to hide from the only relationship they had going at that time besides themselves, and that is with God. Sin will make you hide. You can be sitting right here next to a friend, and spiritually you're as hiding in the weeds as Adam was hiding. That is not what we've been called to do. We are not spiritual hermits. So relationships matter. God's pursuing the relationship that he wants with you. That's, you need to come to know Jesus as your Lord. It doesn't make sense to you. You're confused. Man, we want to talk to you about that. Because nothing else will matter until that gets taken care of correctly. Mm -hmm. And if, you're under, if the Lord's drawing you, I said the Lord pursues our relationship, sometimes he reaches in and gets a hold of our heart and begins to draw us. And you may be feeling that draw. Because mm -hmm. he's pulling you. I'm telling you that that draw, the only way to subside it for yourself, there's two, is to, is to surrender mm -hmm. and experience the greatness of who Jesus is. But there's a danger that if we resist it, that the Lord will harden our hearts. He draws us, and if we resist, that he hardens, and then we don't feel that tug for that relationship anymore. That's a sad place to be. And so I'm telling you, if you're in the midst of being drawn, don't resist. Don't resist. Because the end result, so the opposite, is not where you want to be. And we know it's relationship matters, that God doesn't just pursue and want a relationship with us and then end it once he's got us saved. I'm glad you're saved. Now let me go out, kick you to the back 40. You know, I don't care about you anymore. I'm on to the next guy i got to go save. That's not it. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. Can you see how this fits with our intentional? Meet you where you're at. Help you grow in the intimacy. Because relationship matters. Relationship matters. And so we see in scripture, relationship matters. So what we get is we start to look at for us here as a church. If this is true, if scripture is just filled with this reality, that relationship matters. And if we understand that impact is made most by relationship, not by lecture. So no matter how well we do, I've said this before, no matter how well we do up here, most of you will forget it. Mm -hmm. Whether you liked it or didn't like it, you're going to forget most of what we said. Mm -hmm. We don't feel bad about that. You don't need to feel bad about that. That's just the reality of the way it works, right? And so it's not going to have life change based on what we say up here. And what we desire is for that intimacy to grow in the Lord. So relationship, what do we do as a church to help foster the relationships that lead to the life change that we think is important? Anybody got a guess? Yeah, Mary, thank you. Our discipleship program. Mm -hmm. That's why we are having a discipleship program. It's not so that we can sit and go, yes, great, we got people in discipleship. Doesn't that make us fantastic? We're a great church. Mm -hmm. That isn't it. It's because we recognize the need for relationships. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what will not happen. For some of you, this is a problem. For some of you, here's your problem right here. You're like, what is it that I need to get? For some, this is it. You will not develop the relationships you need to grow in your faith with Christ coming here on Sunday morning only. That's right. That's it will not happen. And so you're only doing that, and there's this absence of a relationship that's building through, and it hinders you from advancing and moving in the way that we're designed to do in our growth and intimacy with the Lord. That's why we made discipleship group, so that we're trying to foster and create this environment where you can grow in relationship with someone else. Now, so everybody who's involved in discipleship, I'm going to ask you this question. I want you to raise your hand if one of these two statements are true. Let me finish for you. If either you have grown in your relationship with someone you already had a relationship with or have developed a new relationship with somebody you didn't really have a relationship with before. I mean, you knew them. You understand what I'm saying? But you, you had it. So if either of those are true, raise your hand if you're involved in discipleship. Wow. So the, the goal is to help foster relationships and the people in, in the discipleship group are going i'm fostering relationships goal reached this is why we talk about it this is why we emphasize it this is why we say something about it this is why we'll come and ask hey how about you you want to be in one this is the reason we feel it's important we think it is the way that we as a corporate group can help 
form and fashion relationships that help grow. Now, is everybody going to be in one? We're hoping. Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. We're not going to make anybody do this. Well, I take that back. <laughs> Every person who has a leadership <laughs> position in our church must be involved in a discipleship program. But even that, that we don't make them. It's their choice. It's their choice. You they cannot be in leadership. They can that. Be. You cannot be a Sunday school teacher. You cannot be uh, on staff, that kind of stuff. Everybody has to do it or they can't be in leadership because it is a core value of who we are. But as far as everybody else is concerned, we're not trying to say you must do this or else you're less than something else. We're saying if you do this, you will grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ and with each other. And it, we need to foster good relationships in our church. The first and foundational community that you're a part of is a family. And if you can look at this country and not see that our families are in serious trouble, they are falling apart all over the place. And it is, it is disastrous what is happening in our nation when it comes to families. And if we, the people of Jesus Christ, who have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, mm -hmm. cannot have good relationships in our family, there's no hope for anybody. And so we've got to do that. And the way we can do that is by fostering relationships in this family where you will grow and learn and develop and be able to grow in your other relationships. Because that will happen if you get involved in discipleship. I'm constantly saying this, though. Discipleship is just a tool. It's just a tool. The program that we have set up is just a tool. <clears throat> there is nothing magical about the books we're doing. They're not, just want to make, they're not the Word of God. They're a tool. We, it's what we're trying to do to help make it easy for you. Some of you like the hard path. Okay. If you like the hard path, what you have to see is that we're making this easy, but you then must walk away where you are developing relationships with other people on your own. You've got to put that emphasis and effort in here to find it in a way that you're developing, forming relationships that you stand together, that you're making the cord that stands united, that you're giving of yourselves also, not just in the gospel, but giving of yourselves, that you're making sacrifice. It's hard. Relationships are hard. How many would say yes? Relationships require How many of you have been hurt by a relationship you had with somebody? How many of you have had to make a sacrifice because of a relationship you have with somebody? It's difficult. This is not an easy thing. God's just not saying, here you go, this is what makes life uh, holly jolly. We're not just saying, be all smiley, this is wonderful. It's work. Hard work. But it's work with the results of helping to develop yourself in your relationship with the Lord. This is how God's designed you to operate in order to be able to create the relationship with him that he desires. And so it's just a tool. If you don't like, if you don't like that, I want you to know I'm very clear. It's just a tool. It's a tool to help you accomplish the things that produce the intimacy with God. It's what we've made available. And if you choose not to walk that path, you just got to find something that is making the same thing. Because what you can't choose to do and grow in it is nothing. Yeah. Can't. And we're going to challenge on that because, man, we want you to grow. It's so good to grow. Don't let your default system right now, some of you right now are defaulting to this. You are saying, I've got good friends in this church. I have relationships in this church. Mm -hmm. And I don't doubt that one bit, that some of you have great relationships in this church. But unless those relationships are concentrating on you and the Lord, growing in your relationship, they're just friends. They're just friends. John, they go to church with me. I, they're just friends. Oh, we go out to think they're just friends. That is not the kind of relationship that is going to spur you on to a new level of your spiritual health and well-being. You've got to work at it. It won't happen. Well, I take that back. Some of you have been in church for 40 years and you've had relationships and you've heard things and by osmosis you, has grown, you have grown some in your, your spiritual life. Organically, that's happening. But it's, it doesn't happen easily and it takes a long time where a dedicated discipleship program where you get involved and you're doing the work and you're sharing your life with each other, 
it grows so much faster. How many can testify that you've grown more in discipleship than you did all the other years of your spiritual life? It just works. Right. So, so as a church, because we value that relationship, discipleship is our main thing that we're doing to try to develop that relationship. But also it's in the way that we look at the activities. Over the summer, we're going to have family fun days. Mm-hmm. We don't do that just because it's summer, so let's have family fun days. It's so that we can get together. We, we changed the Sunday school in the time frame from 9 to 920 to interact. Why? So that we can have a great meal. Good job in the meal today. Journey class provided the meal, right? Everybody ate in Sunday school. Yeah, good job. We do that so that we can have the meal. No, it's so that we can, we can strengthen relationships because we have to spend time interacting. We have to spend time forming those. And, and so it's a value of what we think is important. And so in the, in the process of the things that we'll be doing, it makes a, a difference in the way that we're going to operate. So for us, that's the way it is. Discipleship is at the core of that because we believe it's the fundamental. And then at the way that we orchestrate and structure the church as a whole, we're looking through the lens of how do we help build relationships? That's for us. I'm going to give you today some very specific things for you to do this week or next couple weeks. How are you going to do it? Very specific for you. What do you do with this reality of building relationships? Number one would be join discipleship. <laughs> that's obvious, right? You know, that's the most important. Join discipleship. Yeah, listen, bust me an email saying I'm ready. And we'll figure it out. We'll start, we'll start making a way to make that happen. I, I'm ready. Let's, we'll, we'll start setting up the pathway of what that looks like. We'll begin to move to there. We'll get into the process. I'm not saying that next week you'll be in a discipleship group, but we'll start moving to there. If the Lord's moving in your heart, you say, I'm ready for discipleship. Let us know. We want to get you there. We never want to hold you back. That's number one. Number two, invite someone to your house. I know that scares the bejeevers out of multiple of you. <laughs> a lot of heads went down. You know, hospitality is spoken about in Scripture. It's a command. <laughs> it's a command. What we get, what Pastor talked about, that inward focus. So what we do is we look at our house and ourselves, and we determine that somehow... It's not fit to be used for God for whatever reason that might be that we conjure in our mind. And so then we don't do what God's commanded us to do. Invite somebody to your house. Have them over. And I'm talking about somebody, I mean somebody right here. Invite somebody to your house. One of the the greatest things I heard is a guy that said, quit worrying about it. Put your dishes in a pile. That's you. If your dishes are in a pile, your dishes are in a pile. Who cares? I did that. I had a time where I had dishes in the sink. Someone come over and go, hey, look at that. You got dishes in the sink. I'm like, sure do. They'll wash later. It'll be fine. It's no big deal. Because I soak them in the sink during the day and wash them at night. And it's fine. Hey, if that's you, be you. It's all right. No big deal. Push it over. It's all right. Don't let that stop you from having people to your house. Now, here's, here's the caveat for that. I want you to listen to what Jesus says about what he just said. All right, because this is crucial. In Luke 14, 12, he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you are repaid. Luke 6, 33, if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you for even sinners? do that. So what God is calling us to do is get out of our tight little circle where I'll have you over, you have me over, oh I need some help, I'll help you, then you can help me. All of that is self-fulfilling, reciprocating, all of it's wonderful, but that's not what Jesus is calling us to do. So what you do is you pick out somebody you don't know. Maybe somebody who is economically not where you are and you treat them to a wonderful time and you don't expect anything back in return except you have done that for the cause of Christ. That's what he's saying to do. So develop a relationship with somebody out of your core group. And that means whatever it means to you. Invite them in with your core group. Have over four people to your house. Bring mm-hmm. your core group and bring a yeah. new person that's going to become your new core group. Yeah. 
Jesus was pretty tough on this one issue. He, ha- he would go to anybody's house and be with anybody who invited him. He just did it. He just did it. But he reserved his strongest criticism to those who were phonies. Now, I'm going to say this because this is important. In that age group over there of the people who don't go to church, so I'm not counting them. They're in church. Shoo, whoop. Y'all can breathe again. In the age group that doesn't go to church, the 20s. Eight out of ten of them, when asked what they think about church, they use the same word. You want to know what that word is? Hypocrisy. They view what we're doing with hypocrisy. That was one of the things that Jesus was strongest about. Why is it that we're putting out the message that we are hypocrites in church? we got to change that, folks. And the way you change that is you live a life that is open. I have told you for 20 years that the people you see in Tony and I are the same people you will see with us on Tuesday night or Friday afternoon Mm -hmm. or Saturday. We Mm -hmm. are who we are. We are not something in church and something else somewhere else. I learned that a long time ago. Some of you are super excited about that. Some of you are worried. (laughs) (laughs) it is important for us to break out of our protective cocoons and reach out to people john johnny what was it something in johnny's classroom today was talking about the hurting and the uh, all of that and i'm thinking to myself when he's going through all that i know we're coming over to this building and somebody meets that Somebody fits that description. I know. I know in this room there are people who have broken relationships and broken hearts. They've been deceived or been betrayed. They come in here looking for some kind of hope. And we sit in our little cocooned areas and never reach out to anybody. No wonder some of them think we're hypocrites. We've got to break out of that. We've got to do something different. Go ahead. Third. This one goes with number two. Number two is invite somebody over. Guess what number three is? Go! <laughs> when they invite you over, go. go! Go! You know, flex your schedule if you have to a little bit, but relationships matter. Go! Find a way if somebody invited you to their house, go! Go! Be gracious about whatever it is. That's the same thing. It says you invite you in your house and it's a rich house, great. If they invite you in the house and it's a poor house, great. Go. Eat it up. If you don't like it, do your best. Now, I already told you about the stories trying to do that. Do your best to eat. Have a good time. But go. Don't refuse. Go. That way they can interact. Now, this next one, I almost didn't even bring up. And I know it's going to be a little hard. And it can easily get twisted. And so that's the trouble with it. But I think it's a problem. And so I want to do that. How many of you are familiar with this passage? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with unrighteousness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? How many of you heard that before? What is generally the context in which we apply that passage? Marriage. Marriage. And yet somehow then it's the only relationship we apply it to. Some of you, your problem is this. You can't form the relationships you need to hear that advance you in the kingdom of God because you're too attached to people who are unrighteous and they're pulling you the wrong way. We get confused on what it means to love people into the fellowship of God. What it does not mean, I'm very confident in Scripture, and if if, if you find different, come tell me so I can be corrected. Because I, I I would want to cease sharing the wrong information. It does not mean your best friends should be unbelievers. Throughout the entirety of the Old Testament and the time, God's calling his people to not do that. The whole time. If your close friends that you spend all your time with are not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're yoked to them. You know, that that is like the oxen. They've got the yoke on them, and you are trying to pull towards the Lord, but they are pulling you away. And you will not move as fast as if you make your close friend those who are pulling in the same direction. 
Now you move. Now you go. And we case this, we case this in hypocrisy of wanting to advance the gospel, but usually it's more true it's some type of social thing that we like about it. And we don't want to make the sacrifice. And so, yes, I don't think your friends, your close friends, should be outsiders who don't love Jesus. Now, for me, my problem is I don't have enough outsiders in my life. <laughs> so you're talking to me, i got to work on going to create places where I have these casual relationships that I can invest in and pull into Jesus, because yeah. we should do that. That's me, right? So I, I, that's my issue. That's my struggle because of the nature of where I work. I, I don't, they don't, they don't, I don't, I don't connect on them. You know? Everybody that I hang out with is believers, right? But for some of you, that's the problem. And until you're willing to let go of what's weighing you down and pulling you the wrong way, you're in trouble. And I get it. It's hard. You may have had them for a long time, and they might be super cool. But it won't matter. You need people that you're aligned with who are your core, who are part of your family of God. I would recommend right here. This is where you've joined. This is where you're a part of. This is your family. This is your part of the body of Christ. Find your core and grow in them. That's not scriptural, right? I'm not saying I think there's truth to this. But but not having unbelievers as your core is scriptural. And some of you, that's the problem. And so your challenge this week is to break free. You're yoked where you shouldn't be yoked. And you've got to free yourself. Now, we can see it with them, right? <laughs> we blame them all the time. <laughs> Parents, you can see that. Your kids, you're like, my goodness, yes, they are hanging with the wrong person and they're leading them astray. And Lord, I wish that they would hang with the right people. Now, I'm going to go out with this guy over here who doesn't love Jesus at all. <laughs> Hypocrisy. And so it's, it's a part of valuing relational is understanding that the relationship starts with the core of those who are believers. And then we venture out to bring in. I, I believe this. I'm getting off on tangent because I get it. But I believe that when it talks about that they'll know your love for, they'll know you are my disciples by your love for one another, it's saying that we have such great relationships. We love on each other so well. They go, how do I get to be a part of that? We think it means go love people so well that they'll say they want to come be a part of us. Why do they need to be a part of us? We're already loving on them so well. There's nothing different. They don't need anything different in Jesus. But when we are loving on each other in a way that the world does not understand, when our relationships are a place they can't grasp, when we come alongside each other in times of trouble in a way that, that makes it where there is no pain, there's no difficulty, and we're loving on people the way that the relationship should be, then they say, how do I get to be a part of that? Let me tell you. I want to illustrate what he just said really well, I think. How many of you in here would be brave enough to say, I had a problem with alcohol or drugs. I had a problem with alcohol or drugs. There's some hands going up. Okay. I did too. I, I, I drank religiously. I was enthusiastic about it. The only reason I'm not an alcoholic is because evidently my biological system or the glory of God, one or the other. So I'm not casting dispersions here. But if you had a problem with drugs or alcohol, the worst thing you can do when you quit is what? Hang out with people who do it. That's the failure of most people. They try to, they try to maintain a sober lifestyle living with a bunch of druggies or alcoholics and it doesn't work. If you drink too much, then you don't go to the bar. You can't do that. You have to change who you're hanging out with. And the same thing is true when you're trying to develop your spiritual life. You cannot have a strong spiritual life linked up with a bunch of people who don't even love Christ, who aren't born again, who don't believe the Bible, who won't go to church. It just won't work. Those of us who know, I am who I am because of the grace of God. I am who I am because of the Holy Spirit in my life. And the fact that I left that behind me. Left it behind me. And that's what it's going to take. That's our pillar. Relational. And that's the end of our pillars, right? 
So that's the end of our pillars. You can look and see. Biblical is our foundation. We're biblical. Intentional is our focus. Generational is our following. And relational is our format of how we look at it. And if you look at the top, what does that make us? Bigger. 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 That makes us bigger. Now, I want to be very clear about that because I believe wholeheartedly that following these will make us bigger. And when I say bigger, I do mean I think people will come. But that's not well, the only part of it. No. That's not it. We're going to be bigger in our faith. We're going to be bigger in our generosity. We're going to be bigger in our serving. We're going to be bigger in our love. We're going to be bigger in our knowledge of who Christ is. We're going to be bigger in our sharing of the gospel. We're going to be bigger. We're going to love on people in a way, and it's going to be exciting. It's going to be marvelous how God works. And if he fills it up with people like that, fantastic. If he, if he uh, has a funnel where people come in and they get bigger and then he funnels them out to serve someplace else, to his glory. Okay. But we're going to be bigger because we're going to stand on what these truths are. And we're going to watch the Lord do his work. And it's going to be exciting. And we want you to join. That's it. That's where we're moving. Come be a part. Come be a part. Be a part of that in your own self. Let God do that in you. Bigger. Ephesians 4.11 says God gave gifted people to the church so he could build up people, edifying up the body, so they could do the work of ministry. And the whole thing would be built up. So that's what he's talking about. It, it, it just is a process by which the Spirit of God gifts leaders to lead a church, to feed a church, to direct a church, so that the church people will grow in their faith, and they will then begin to conduct the work of the ministry, and the result will be the whole body is lifted up. Not only spiritually lifted up, but in all ways lifted up. That's, that's what it's all about. That's why we have church. So we can impact the generations with Jesus Christ. And you can't do any of that unless you are born again. I'm telling you, churches are full of unsaved people. I don't know that our church is, but churches are full of unsaved people. We have entire denominations that have given over to liberalism and modernism and reject the Bible and don't read the Bible, don't preach the Bible, don't do anything, and there's no way a person could come into that church and know the truth of the gospel. Mm. They may come in saved, but they will not get saved there because it's never presented. And God help us if that becomes Marceline Baptist mm. Church. I'm not going to, as long as there's life in me and the Spirit of God is living in me, Scott and I are committed to the fact that you've got to hear the gospel every week. And here's the gospel. There is nothing good in you. Boom. God says all of your works of righteousness are as filthy rags. And I don't even want to explain what that means. Instead, God says, he commended his love towards all of us rotten sinners. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God loves us so much that he won't leave us being rotten sinners. He changes our life. So the gospel is Jesus came to earth. He didn't begin on earth. He came to earth, lived a sinless life, died a sinner's death, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and three days later came out of it proving to be the Son of God with power. And he said, if you want to go to heaven, you have got to go through me. And what that means is you must, like a child, accept what he says is true. And what he says is, you can't do it on your own. There's not enough good in any of us to make it. And there's not enough bad in any of us to keep us from getting there. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone who will redeem your life. And if you're here and you don't know that in the deepness of your own soul, then I implore you, I beg you, and take the time this morning to talk to one of us. 
Let us just share with you the truth of the gospel so you can know what it means to be mm -hmm. loved by God. And when you are loved by God, you won't mind loving me. That's what the scripture says. So are you saved this morning? The second thing I want to say before we go into our thing is if there is a bit of hypocrisy in you, and that simply means I'm one way here, I'm another way here then I would invite you to come to an old-fashioned altar and pour it out to God and say to God, I am guilty of a two-faced kind of life, and I want it to be done. Mm -hmm. I want to be transparent before you. I want to be transparent before your people. He will change your heart. Heavenly Father, we do thank you today. What a gift of grace. There, I cannot even begin to calculate the enormity of what you've done in my life. Thank you for that. I know I didn't deserve anything I have today, but yet you, in your grace and mercy, have provided that for me. I pray that today each person sitting in this room right now would know deep in their hearts where their relationship is with you. If they don't have that confidence, then I would ask you, Father, to make them so miserable they cannot walk away without getting it straight with you. They don't have to get it right with me. They don't have to surrender to me. They need to surrender to you, and I hope that they would do that today. We trust you. We ask you to fill us with yourself so much this week that we really can love each other the way you want us to love each other and reach out to a hurting and dying uh, generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we ask, amen.